It's four o'clock on a Thursday. You know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! Oh my, what an exciting show we have today. And thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Gotta love iCarly. And let's put that away and see who is in the chat room. Look pretty full. Hello, Akira Canyon, John Pearson, Martin Gravel, Dan Weber, Nancy Collell, Rick Cabot, Podmore. It's a beautiful day. You know, that's what I am. I'm the Mr. Rogers of the music industry. <laughs> Greg Carroza, Dean Turner. Hello, Il Rosso, Emil. Il Rosso, we solved your, uh, I think, uh, solved your problem with the uh, forum. Uh, Bob Gunnerfelt. Spiritual, Daryl Berman, Songs from a Headband, Andre Stepanian. Hello, everybody. So, hello, Darren Fletcher. Uh, I was a little stumped uh, about what we should talk about today. And uh, I'm thinking that maybe for the second half of the hour, we do some phone calls. Uh, haven't done those in a while. Oh, and Peter Rahill, 11th Like. Um, yeah, for those of you who are new and don't know the drill, please smash that like button and subscribe so you get daily alerts about these wonderful hangouts. Um, anyway, to start today's show, if you call this a show, I want to talk about, you guys know, there we go, that I love this book, <clears throat> Demystifying the Genre. <laughs> Why well, can't that? <laughs> Everything is backwards, damn it. Demystifying the Genre by Dean Crepain. Sorry, I've got a <clears throat> frog in my throat today, and I've been drinking iced coffee, which doesn't help it because it's got dairy in it. Oh, actually, I got a, a comment from somebody that said, please stop, stop slurping your drinks while you're broadcasting. Hello, Jim Stamper. How are you, Darren Moss? Um, man, I feel a sneeze coming on. I always walk outside. Couple, you know, I get set up for the show, and right before the show, I just walk outside and like look up at the sky and look at the mountain and just, you know, ah, take it all in. And unfortunately, it's just it's hot and the wind is blowing, and I think there's a lot of pollen and. Uh, I think I'm about ready to go into a sneezing fit, so excuse me if I slurp or sneeze. <laughs> yeah, somebody actually posted that. Why is that dude slurping his drink? This is for him. Oh, that's nice. Poppy Paul says he feels a fart coming on. You know, I've got to say... I've been broadcasting, uh, doing taxi TVs now for over 10 years, I think. And not once have I ever let one slip during a broadcast. <clears throat> Aren't you proud of me? <laughs> uh, so I want to take, now let's see if I can find it. Uh, na, 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 na. I want to talk about tension cues. And I know a lot of you guys already know what a tension cue is, but I get emails, I get stuff on LinkedIn, and please don't email me on LinkedIn because I don't check it every day. And then people get cranky with me when uh, I don't respond to their LinkedIn uh, comments to me. Um, I'm not that much of a uh, power user of social media of any form. Um, Nancy Collell appreciates that, yeah. You know, when we're in the office, uh, Bria and Ariana usually sit across the desk from me while I'm doing the show. Hey, Marcus. Um, so they probably really appreciate it. <laughs> anyway, uh, wow, gyms are opening up tomorrow in San Diego. <laughs> uh, okay, so... I know that you know most most of the people who watch the daily show, the quarantini hangouts uh, or uh, quarantini happy hours. Sorry, um, 
you guys are pretty advanced, you know, you know the drill, um, but not everybody who watches, hey Mark Reel, uh, not everybody who watches these things, um, especially people watch the archives, know what the hell we're talking about a lot. So I want to talk about tension cues. <laughs> I'm trying so hard not to sneeze. <laughs> um, and tension cues are popular. They get requested all the time. Sorry, I got to blow my nose. <coughs> all right, add that to the list of things I shouldn't do while on the air, right? Um, anyway, tension cues, they, they come in all sorts of different varieties. Uh, it could be a tension cue, like a CSI lab thing, you know, womp, 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 that kind of thing. A tension cue could be in a competition show. Um, it could be an athletic competition, like one of those, you know, super, those guys that swing from rings and climb over things and jump and do all that stuff. Could be that kind of tension. It could be a tension cue, uh, the bachelor or bachelorette waiting to see is they're doing an elimination. You know, there are all kinds of shows that do eliminations. Um, so I just want to talk about tension cues and I'm going to quote Dean's book liberally here. Um, tension cue under the gun. That's the name of the cue that's referenced. And by the way, if you buy the book, it's got a link that takes you to all the cues that are mentioned in the book so that you can listen to them while you're reading the stuff, which makes it really, really good. Um, this is a short 70 second cue that uses arpeggio synth and a variety of sweeping pads as well as percussion, bass, and drums. So not that much, much instrumentation. Under the, under the gun is in a minor key with these fundamental attributes. Starts off with a dark energetic groove and a heartbeat, kick, and bass. Slowly builds intensity by adding bass and drums. Builds tension and interest. That's important, you know. Um, cues of almost every variety um, need to feel like they're moving forward, like they're going somewhere, not just sitting there going bump, 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 bump for 70 seconds. They've, they've got to build um, and feel like they're going towards the goalpost, if you will. Um, so builds tension and interest with a variety of synth pads. So, you know, start out skinny uh, with maybe just one synth pad, then add another, and then maybe another layer of synth. Um, it's got a dark pad that drones throughout. Um, very little to no discernible melody. This cue, meaning the one that he's talking about here in the book, um, is really more like an underscore. Um, he mentions again, it's in a minor key and it doesn't break the mood or the vibe, which is really critical for cues. A lot of times people who are just starting out doing this stuff want to get really creative and feel like they're creating a very moving score, but it's really hard to take something that's more like a score and fit it into a scene because when you scored a picture, you are scoring to the various actions and dialogue that happen in the scene. So you might ramp something up, and then bring it down according to what the picture is doing. Um, hey, Paul House. Um, so with a, a cue, you wanna keep it just one thing. You keep it moving forward. You build it up, build it up, break it down, build it back up, build it back up, and boom, out to the big finish, which is usually a stinger or a buttoned ending. Um, which means ending usually on the tonic and usually like on a downbeat, something, a final thing, not a fade. So, bam. Um, and of course, that varies with the uh, genre of music you're doing. Um, if you're doing, let's say, a string quartet, it probably wouldn't be a big dramatic finish like you might have in an action adventure cue. Um, so I tend to call those things buttoned endings when it's not a bigger dramatic ending. Um, I call it a button and uh, that's just a personal preference of mine. Other people do that as well, but not everybody. Um, and a stinger to me implies, you know, more of an exclamation point. Um, it's punctuation, you know, so you want to punctuate the ending. Um, and the reason that you do that is because editors can't deal with the fade. 
they need something that typically coincides with the last beat of the visual, you know, the last frame of the visual, bump and the door shuts, or bump and somebody leaves a room, or bump and it cuts to another scene. So remember, no fades. It's extremely rare. I, I honestly can't think of a time where we've ever had anybody request a cue that actually had a fade. Um, never changes chords or goes to a B section. So he's talking about this particular cue because it's kind of a drone that it doesn't go to a B section. But other types of tension cues and cues in general often do uh, go to a B section. I personally tend to say that uh, most of a cue is an A section, which is kind of like the chorus of a song. It's the red meat, it's the good juicy stuff. Um, and if you go to a B section, which is usually about the midpoint of the cue, but doesn't have to be, none of these rules are absolutes. These are just kind of guidelines. There's a word we've heard a lot of so far this year, guidelines. Uh, and the B section, I think, is kind of like a bridge in a song. So think of, you know, 90 seconds-ish of an A section with practically no intro. If it's got an intro, it should be really short. Um, as those of you who've been to the Road Rally and saw Laurel Ostrander, who's a, a great video editor, uh, do her thing on stage at the Road Rally, she, she threw out a tip that I think everybody, even our most experienced cue makers in the audience, um, went, oh, well, there's something new I didn't think of. She said that editors love it. Um, rather than starting out with an intro, that you start out with uh, something that uh, kind of a, a front frontal punctuation, I guess you would call it. Maybe, um, let's say you were doing, uh, remember Funk 49 by Joe Walsh? the kind of staccato-y guitar part. So let's say you're doing a rock guitar uh, cue. You might start it out with just just <laughs> pretty good, huh? That's me doing a Joe Walsh guitar right there. Um, you might just start out with chong, boom, right into it. That's enough. That gives them some punctuation when the cue makes its entrance, right? Dan Weber says, keep it interesting, right, Michael? Yeah, prefrontal, there you go. Um, and John Pearson sampling that. All right, I want 10% of everything it goes into. <laughs> or no, you better get a work for hire from me, Pearson. <laughs> um, Edmund Red says, Laurel was out of this world. Yes, she was, she was amazing. Um, I could just sit here and read the comments all day. <laughs> anyway, uh, these types of cues get used all the time. And again, he's talking about a tension cue that's drone-like. Um, we've had a lot of requests for those, obviously, that will likely go in the post-pandemic uh, movies of the week and such. Uh, these types of cues get used all the time. However, any active music library has tons of them. If I was pitching this now, I'd want to make certain that at least one of my sounds, maybe the drum kit was unique and it had something that would differentiate it from all the other tension cues in a publisher's library. So the reason that I picked this was because it talks about differentiation, right? Now, what did I do? Oh man, I didn't bring that book downstairs. I don't want to run up and grab it. Um, I was reading yet another marketing book this morning, which says something that virtually every marketing book talks about and it all goes for full circle back to coming up with your unique selling proposition or your USP and your tagline. Um, there are a million great composers out there. Well, at least thousands of them. Um, and many of them are taxi members. So what can you do to differentiate yourself? What can you say about yourself that differentiates yourself? That, you know, to say... Um, experienced instrumental cue composer. It's not bad because it tells people what you are in a very succinct and direct way, but um, say something that differentiates you. Uh, 
experienced instrumental cue composer that always delivers on time. So, almost lost my page. Um, so that's a differentiator. Now, it could be said that, well, if there are 10,000 instrumental cue composers, um, that maybe 437 of them are really good at delivering on time all the time. That's true, but 437 of those people don't necessarily watch this show and aren't going through the exercise of trying to come up with a USP. So you may be the only person that says that. So therefore, you are going to stick out. So maybe the drum kit was unique that had something that would differentiate it from all the other tension cues in a publisher's library. Maybe uh, even adding an instrument not usually associated with tension. Um, I was going to say, and this is Dean speaking, of course, I was going to say to maybe add bagpipes as a joke, but the more I think about putting bagpipes in a queue like this, I think, uh, I think that might actually be a good idea. The bagpipes have a very signature sound, and the moment you hear them, you are taken straight to Scotland or have Scottish images pop into your head. Um, so, most certainly, any film or TV show set in Scotland could use a tension track with subtle bagpipes. And then he says, parenthetically, is there such a thing? Why no, Dean, I don't believe there is. I hope Dean's watching the show today. Um, he, he tends to, uh, I think he, he does uh, his stationary bike while he watches the show or something like that, or maybe he runs on treadmill. So Dean, if you're out there, buddy, say hello. Um, For some reason, uh, funeral scenes featuring a New York police officer come to mind when thinking bagpipes. Maybe I've been watching too many movies. I don't think you can watch too many movies if this is what you want to do with your music. You know, I, I always chuckle when I hear people that kind of say, ah, yeah, I don't watch much TV. You know, like they're too cool to watch TV because TV is bad. Well, even if TV is bad or you don't like what's on TV, Watch it for the music. Everything you need to know is coming out of your TV speakers every night of the year. Um, enough on bagpipes. If you find a unique instrument or new sound to insert to your tension tracks, you will increase your chances of cutting through the clutter. Now, you could use, um, this is me speaking, not Dean, but I'm pretty sure he would agree with me. Um, you could use found sounds. What are found sounds? Well, a found sound might be could be a slurp. Could be the ice shaking in my Ooh, that was really good. I love mm, getting to the bottom of an iced coffee. Nothing like it. Um, a found sound could be anything. Could be a toilet flush that is pitched way down and slowed way down. It could be ice shaking in the glass. It could be finger on the rim of a wine glass. It could be a violin bow on a saw. Uh, it could be a dragging a brick across concrete and sampling that. Um, so Get creative. Um, you know, people say, well, I don't want to go spend two or three hundred bucks on a Zoom recorder. Well, guess what, folks? You've got all you need right there. Look at that. Ooh. Nice reflection of the show. Um, use your phone. I honestly, sometimes I'm amazed by the quality of the audio and video that comes out of my phone. What do I have? Not a particularly new phone. I think it's like two or three years old. It's a... Uh, Samsung S9, the thing has amazing video and audio on it. It really sounds good. Um, Mark Real says, I watch movies and TV in a completely different way because of Taxi. Excuse me. Um, well, at least I didn't pass gas. Uh, Peter Rahel says, my flip phone is very limited. Does it have the big buttons and the big letters on it? Peter um, John Pierce says, I pulled cow chains into my bedroom studio a few years ago, recorded, then chopped them up to fit a tempo. Nice. Uh, is there anything else you want to tell us about those chains in your bedroom, John? <laughs> um, 
Keith says he's got an S5, Samsung S5 going old school. I got to say, up until I got this thing a few years ago, I had an S6 for probably five years. I, that phone was fine. Honestly, the only reason I got the S9, what, what was the reason? Oh, I remember now. It's because uh, Verizon kept charging me the monthly phone. You know, like you're basically leasing a phone over time and they charge like an extra 20 bucks a month or something. They kept charging me that, even though my phone had long ago been paid off. So they actually cut me a deal. They backtracked on the payments and applied them to the S9, so I couldn't argue with it. iPhone all the way. Well, let's not get into that because that's, you know, that's like Mac versus PC, and none of us will ever win that. Um, Uh, Jai King says, I made a recent recording of my weird refrigerator that sounded like angelic voices when it cycles. There you go. Um, so found sounds, you know, um, let's say that you're doing a tension cue and it's got that arpeggiated bump, 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 bump thing going on. Um, here's one that I did many years ago. We're talking like 35 years ago in the studio, way before samplers were very prevalent. Uh, and I actually did this to a piece of quarter inch tape on a reel, on a Studer reel to reel. Um, I took a rubber band and knotted it on both ends. Well, actually one, end, I, I took a shoe box and then took a fairly hefty rubber band and poked holes in both sides of the top of the shoe box, you know, on the sides and then ran made like a, a bass instrument out of a shoebox, empty shoebox, um, with this rubber band, and then did exactly that where I, I plucked it, boink, 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 uh, and then slowed it down. That actually got used in a Hertz commercial. Um, so found sounds, man, they're everywhere. And you can easily add those. So the thing to know is I've got a rule that I use in my life for whether it's for taxi accounting or marketing stuff. Um, if I were producing something, um, everybody wants new and different, but they don't want it that different. Because if you do something like the Dean's, you know, talking about the bagpipes, yeah, you could pitch it down, but a regular bagpipe, bag pipe, you know, it's like nobody wants to be standing next to a bag, bagpipe. Even some Scottish guy with kilts generally doesn't, it's not mellifluous, you know? It ain't the prettiest sounding instrument in the world. Sorry if I offended anybody in Scotland. But doing something that's 15% different, where it's just enough to make them go, oh, you know, that's cool. Oh, that's original. That's different. There you go. That's what you want to do. Um, you don't want to make it so different that it makes people turn their heads. You know, if, if your cue is getting their attention, then it's probably not serving the picture very well. And by serving the picture, I mean, your job is your music's job is to not generally be the star of the show. That would be a concert or that would be a radio. Um, your music is there to support the scene and support the emotion and the vibe. So anything you can do to make it 5, 10, 15% difference so that it's notable, but not noticeable, if you know what I mean, um, that could be a good thing. So there you go. Um, there's my little spiel about... Uh, Cues. Um, any questions? Meliflu, miflupus. <laughs> that sounds like something you get removed at the doctor's office. Bear McCreary loves bagpipe. Hey, Cass, how are you? John Pearson says, that's a great point. I need to put that in practice and will. Michael's Q-tips. There you go. Oh, I like that. Um, here's a guy who goes out on the street during rush hour to practice his bagpipes all summer. Man, I hope he's not too close to anybody's house or apartment. Notable, not noticeable, going in my notebook. There you go. 
what was that sound in Psycho just before the knife shower scene? Was that sound in Psycho just before the knife shower scene a found sound? Honestly, don't know. Ooh, John's going on vacation. Yay, I'm envious. I actually said to my wife the other night, we've been going for walks probably five, six nights a week. Um, as the sun is starting to get low on the horizon, it cools off. We'll go for like a mile, mile and a half walk most nights. And I said to her the other night, you know, why don't we sneak away and do like a four day weekend in Cancun? Cancun was almost untouched, at least last time I looked, which is like a month and a half ago had very, very, very few cases of coronavirus. I do believe that air travel has become probably safer now than it was before the virus because they go to great lengths to sanitize the planes. Um, oh, you're going snook hunting at Fort Walton Beach? Oh, be still my heart. I am definitely je jealous of that. Um, Greg Carrozza, goes for walks with my wife or his wife in the mornings around 7 a.m. There you go. Get that blood flowing for the rest of the day. Anyway, uh, she didn't say no. She's like, hmm, maybe. Um, there is incredible snook fishing, tarpon fishing, permit fishing. Permit is a type of fish and bone fishing uh, in Cancun. And June through August is like prime time down there. And uh, it, it's just... I love it down there. And so if we went, my wife would basically, you know, sit under an umbrella somewhere out by the pool or down by the ocean or, and yours truly would go, um, I go fishing with a guide that has like a, about an 18 to 20 foot boat, the kind with the, uh, casting platform, you know, for fly fishing, uh, up on the back and he pulls around, you know, and he always says, you know, Two o'clock over there. Uh, <laughs> when I cast, he, he's always commenting. I'm, I've been, I've probably gone out with this guy 20 or 30 times now over a period of like 10, 15 years, I guess. And uh, he's so funny. Uh, his name is Mauricio and his English is about 30%. My Spanish is about 2%. So we mostly communicate with hand signals, but at least we've got fishing in common. And, uh, oh, I got a great funny story I'll tell you in a minute. So Mauricio stands up there on the platform pulling the boat and I'm out on the bow of the boat and I've got on my fishing shirt and my hat and probably my, uh, well, wherever it is, you know, my thing that I pull up to cover myself from sun and my hat's pulled down way low and all you can see is my sunglasses. And um, the way you fish for most of these fish I'm talking about is you spot them. You see them tailing in the water or you see them rolling on the surface. So you can see them from like 20 feet to 150 feet away and you cast at them. <clears throat> but a lot of times you're casting, could be casting like just a shrimp about that big on a hook or maybe a little um, like a minnow, which, you know, would be about that big. They weigh like a matchbook and you are casting them oftentimes into the wind. But if you cast really hard to make them go far enough to get to where the fish is, the bait will fly off the hook and then you've just fed the fish and Mauricio will yell at me. Uh, Cass says, Playa del Carmen is beautiful at sundown. Playa del Carmen is beautiful 24 hours a day. Um, yep, sight casting is the, the best. Um, Oh yeah, I've gone fly fishing. I'm just, my side cast is good. You know, I could put it in a floating tire from like 75 feet away with a side cast. More often than not, my overhead casting leaves a lot to be desired, Andre. Um, anyway, uh, what the hell was I talking about? Oh, so Mauricio, uh, the guide. Um, after we went out three or four times, he liked me enough apparently and trusted me enough that he let me drive the boat sometimes. Maybe he was working on some um, tackle, maybe uh, he was getting the net ready because sometimes we have minnows before we go out in the morning. He'll go get them before I show up and I show up at like 6 a.m. 
Um, so the first time he let me drive the boat, he says, okay, you drive the boat. And he takes this big round cast net and he holds the, the rope in his mouth <clears throat> and he stands up on the bow of the boat and I have to go, it just passed idle speed along the mangroves in this beautiful crystal clear water back in what looks like the Everglades. I mean, you're out in the middle of kind of nowhere uh, in this beautiful water. And uh, so he's going like this, like slow down, speed up, you know, left, right. Um, and I'm guiding the boat, I mean, right up next to the mangroves. But if you get up close enough where you scrape the boat against the mangroves, the, the bait fish are gonna go scatter so one day uh i'm driving the boat i think it was the first time he let me do it. and mauricio's up there and he's got the rope in his mouth and he's got the net ready to throw it and he's looking all over for the bait fish and he tells me slow down slow down and then he went like this i thought he's telling me uh throw it in reverse but so i threw it in reverse and he went head first off the front of the boat and came up wearing the net it was really funny he didn't think it was nearly as funny as I did. Um, yep, four to five hundred dollars a day, totally worth it. Uh, absolutely. I fishing. I always wonder, you know, it, it's like if I were seventy and retired and could go fishing every day, would I get sick of it or not? I don't know, uh, but I love it. It's the best. Uh, I'm so jealous you're going on a vacation. Um, okay, so what should we do now? Um, does anybody have any questions that are worthy of me calling you? The 2.30 surprise. Yeah, let's make some phone calls. Come for the music advice, stay for the fishing stories. Jim Stamper says, don't retire, Michael. <laughs> Keith LeBrant's here for the car giveaway. Which car? That car? All right, um, can't get situated here. <sighs> All right, uh, so does somebody have a question that's worthy of me calling? Il Rosso is like, no questions for the phone in? Pulling up my database, so if somebody says yes, I can find you. Wow, I can't believe Paul is asking this because um, I had this very thought walking up the stairs this morning. Yes, I did get a haircut. Uh, it's really big news here in Southern California. Everybody's talking about it. <laughs> um, okay, how did I used to approach a mix? What did I do first? I literally had that very thought this morning, Paul, so I'm tickled that you asked. Um, I would almost always start out with the kick and the bass. Um, that's just the way I was taught. Um, there were a few exceptions, a few times in my career where maybe if something um, was very piano driven or primarily acoustic guitar driven, I might start out bringing those, let's say, let's say it was piano, acoustic piano, grand piano, stereo mic. I would probably have started out with the piano and then brought the vocal in and got that balance to be where I wanted it and then bring up the other instruments. But 98% of the time, I would start with the kick and the bass. And once you get to know your console and your metering um, and you work at a certain level in the same room all the time, it's really easy to kind of do that stuff fast. So I would probably bring up the kick, which I typically kept on, on track two. Um, 
bring that up and uh, I'm the kind of guy that will EQ, compress, limit, do whatever I have to do directly to tape, which I know we don't use anymore, but there you go. Um, so then I would bring it up. It, a kick, when I brought up a kick drum, it basically sounded like I wanted it to sound already. I really didn't have to do a lot to it after the fact. If I did any EQ or compression to it, it was probably after I brought everything else in and I realized that there was a problem that needed to be solved. But just on its face, I would just bring up the kick um, and usually I could bring the fader up to zero and there you go, it was right where it needed to be. So um, then I would bring in the bass and at Criteria, they definitely had a sound at that studio. Miami had a sound, Criteria led the charge on what that sound was. Um, if you want to get a great idea, uh, listen to You Should Be Dancing by the Bee Gees. Um, any of the Bee Gees stuff, but that song in particular had a great sounding kick and bass and the relationship was as close to perfect as you might get. Um, some of the earlier, early-ish Stevie Wonder stuff, um, Inner Visions, that record, great kick and bass relationship. Um, so anyway, I would get those two things happening and I knew, I mean, my master fader would be all the way up um, and I would say that I was probably in VU mode because we didn't use peak reading meters a lot back then. They weren't that reliable in the mid 70s. They were coming into their own, but they weren't nearly as good as they are now. So you get used to whatever you've got. And I got very good at using VU meters. And I would say, generally speaking, with the kick and the bass, that they were probably right around minus four, minus five maybe sometimes as high as minus three if there wasn't a lot of other stuff with a lot of energy coming in, you know, later on down the line in the mix. So that was it. Bass and drums, get that, or bass and kick, um, then bring in the snare drum. Then I would bring in the tom-toms, um, and then I would bring in the overheads. And frankly, I would say... 50% of the time, maybe 60% of the time. I didn't find it necessary, unless I was doing a disco uh, disco record, um, I generally would not be inclined to bring up the hi-hat on its own track. I recorded it on its own track. I tend to like thin, wispy sounding hi-hats. Um, again, listen to like Eagle or Bee Gees hi-hats. Those were the ones that I liked because that's what was around me all the time. Those were the people I learned from, from and that's what I was influenced by. Okay, so now I've got my drums up. And then I would go take a break and come back and don't make the mistake of taking a break, walking back into the room and standing up and hitting play. Because you got the sounds when you were sitting down and the speakers are parallel to your ear's horizon, and that's where they should be. So if you walk back in the room after you've given yourself a little ear break, after being beat in the face with the drums for a half an hour while you're bringing that stuff up and checking it out, and you come back and you're standing up, the perspective is different, the sounds are gonna be different, the bottom end is gonna be different while you're three feet higher than you were when you're sitting down. So then, um, then I would consider, okay, what's the next most important thing? And that was kind of my approach to mixing overall anyway, is go by import. What is, and I don't mean import like importing data, uh, I mean import, what's the next most important thing? Um, generally, I wouldn't leave, uh, I wouldn't treat the vocal until later on in the mix, but let's say it's a, a guitar-based song. So then I would bring up the guitars and then you look at, uh, you know, what are the guitar parts doing? Are they bell tone, like long legato reverb drenched bell tones? Are they Joe Walsh doing Funk 49? So let's make the assumption for this fake mix we're talking about here that uh, you've got an acoustic guitar doing like four, four strums, peaceful, easy feeling, eagerly strums. And then uh, you've got an electric guitar part that's doing the, like, you know, 
uh, trying to think of a song. Um, but you know, just like chink, chink, just timekeeping a uh, little, you know, halfway up the neck with like a little bastardized F chord, uh, you know, or a baby bar chord, doing um, inverted chinks just to keep a rhythm. Um, so I would pan those guys probably full left and full right and get those to be in perspective with my kick, my bass, and the rest of my drums. And then if I had keyboards, I'd bring those in and I would generally, uh, let's say that I had an acoustic grand piano. Um, number one rule for me personally, uh, when recording a piano for rock and roll. This wouldn't necessarily apply to recording piano uh, for a classical piece. Um, but if you're doing, you know, just straight up rock and roll with the piano, um, it, it always bothered me that people would open the lid to a piano and do an overdub and talk about, oh, I'm going to capture this gorgeous, you know, piano sound uh, using the mics in an MS pattern or an XY pattern from, you know, six feet out with the lid open. Well, in rock and roll, no, it's this, you know, it's not that, uh, it's, it's a different thing. So I mean, there were times where I would overdub a piano for rock and roll. I would still close the lid on the piano and put moving blankets on top of it and close mic it because that's the way it would have been if I were doing it as an overdub. It, I want it to sound like it was recorded in the room with the rest of the band. So how would I have treated it in the room with the rest of the band. So now uh, I tend to take, uh, and you guys are gonna laugh at this, but I would take a Sony ECM-50 lavalier mic. Uh, for a while, I had a Radio Shack lavalier mic that was like $14 or $17. The thing sounded great on a piano on the top end. And where do most people play? In a middle octave, right? Only occasionally do they go out of that range. So, um, it doesn't make sense to have, you know, one of these mic situations all the way back here because you don't really get much of a stereo image. So I would close mic it and I would probably get the mics down to anywhere between four inches and eight inches off the strings. Um, and if you use uh, a mic that doesn't have a lot of bottom end on it, like a lavalier mic, um, it naturally rolls off the bottom, so you're not picking up a lot of the, the, what the left hand is doing in the microphone that's on the right hand side. Ooh, that's weird. I just had a really weird glitch on my screen. It looked like somebody turned it on, turned it off in a split second. Not a good sign. Might be time for that new computer. So, now I've got the piano, and I bring that up. But here's the important thing is if the acoustic guitar part is doing open chord 4-4 four, four strumming um, and the song is in the key of G, it's a pretty beefy acoustic guitar part, right? So you've got that pan to the left, but you've got the high notes from the Strat doing the chink, chink on the right, and they're counterbalancing each other. You always want to try and go for balance unless you have a reason not to, but it's a great starting point. So now I've got those two things balancing each other out. If I were to bring up the piano and bring it up where I've got it panned from the player's perspective, and I generally tended to pan my drums from the player's perspective and my piano from the player's perspective rather than audience perspective, just my own personal thing I came up with. I think I was not, I didn't go with the crowd at criteria on that one. They always liked whispering about me behind my back. So if you bring up the piano from the player's perspective, the bass energy is going to be on the left side along with that acoustic guitar that also has a fair amount of bass energy because you're playing it you know, low on the neck in a fairly low key um, with a lot of bass. So I would pan the piano opposite where it was now from the audience perspective where what the left hand was doing on the lower end, excuse me, was happening in the right speaker and the higher stuff was panned opposite from the chink chinks on the strat to the other side. So it all balanced out. There you go. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, oh, vocals. Lead vocal always down the middle. 
Um, I would oftentimes record uh, a lead vocal. I mean, when I started an album and first started doing vocals uh, as overdubs as opposed to doing them live with the band, um, I would generally start out with an 87, sometimes a 414. Um, sometimes on rare occasions I would try a 57 or a Sennheiser 421 some, for some things like really balls to the wall rock and roll. A dynamic mic works, especially if you've got a guy that loves to sing on stage or a girl uh, loves to sing on stage, um, give them a 57 and let them hold it in their hand and turn down the lights in the room and light some candles and, and just crank it up in their uh, headphones and let them sing like a rock star. Don't worry that it doesn't sound perfect. Capture the performance. Um, that's where they're comfortable. So um, now you've got the vocal and you bring that up in the center. At that point, I probably wouldn't add anything other than maybe just a pinch of compression if I needed it. Um, I probably compressed it pretty well going to tape, again in quotes. Um, no fancy chain on the vocal. Um, you would be surprised. You know, I would probably use the onboard EQ on my SSL. Um, I probably would use like a, uh, let's see, an LA3 was probably my go-to compressor. I love those things. Um, I had some original, like real original LA2s. Um, I love those, they sound great. I think the world loves them more than I personally did. They're great, but to me, they weren't amazing. It's like, they were pretty slow on the attack. Um, so I tended to not use them a lot on vocals, but I, I liked my LA3s, what can I say? Um, I didn't, you don't necessarily want a fast attack, something like a DBX 160, uh, because that's probably gonna be too fast, unless it's a really staccato vocal, a screaming staccato vocal, a, a DBX 160 might be good on that. Um, Cass says, yeah, remember Michael's talking from the perception of, a, of recording with great mics for the most part. That's true, but you know, I mean, frankly, the microphone I'm using here for Taxi TV, I could make an entire album with this uh, Audio Technica AT2020. It sounds fine. Um, anyway, okay, so the vocal is in. So much for the phone calls, right? The, the vocal is there. It's front and center. And I would probably then take a break, walk out of the room, and come back in a half an hour later and sit down and just listen to the whole thing top to bottom, not just a little bit, but top to bottom. So then, um, so now I've got the keyboards, guitars, bass, drums, um, and the vocal. So now you're going to secondary and tertiary guitar parts or keyboard parts. Those I may not pan far left and far right. Those might go at 10 and two, depending on how busy they are, what kind of part they are, what the overall sound of, of the mix is. There's no absolute prescription for that, but that 10 and two would probably be my starting point. Um, I'm not a fan, and some of my colleagues back in the day, they would spend a day just on reverb for one song for a mix, literally a day. Um, and, and they would have, uh, yes, Keith, I did stack compressors back then, but not a lot, uh, but I, I did do it. Actually, you know who taught me how to do that? It was Neil Young. Um, uh, Martin's asking, did I pan reverb on the opposite side? Yes. Um, so my colleagues, those guys were, it's because like digital reverb was just starting to become a thing. Um, I did have a Lexicon 224, the original white face one, which sounded really, really good. Um, was a great box. At one point for about a year, I had a, uh, oh God, what's that thing? It looked like R2-D2. Um, stood about two and a half feet tall, three feet tall. Um, oh, an EMT-250. I had an EMT-250, which was one of, it was like 20,000 bucks for that thing. Um, that was a very rich sounding reverb that got used on a lot of records. AMS reverbs didn't exist yet. 
So back then, kind of, you either had live chambers, EMT steel plates. Um, when the Lexicon 224 came out, pretty much any studio that mattered got those. Um, and then eventually around 1980, 81, I would say, studios started getting the EMT 250. And that's when people became much more interested in digital reverb than in chambers or plates because they were a lot more flexible. You could do more stuff with it. Um, <laughs> Rick Cabot Podmore, oh my gosh, uh, EMTs. Yeah, I had EMT at one point in my, the last studio I worked in in New York, I had two EMT plates, which... I got from Phil Ramone, so you can imagine the records those were used on. And where did Phil Ramone get them from? The other Phil. I'm talking about the Phil that's in prison. Wall of Sound, Phil Spector. So I had, for about three years, I had Phil Spector's actual two EMT plates that went on all those great Phil Spector records, like the Ronettes and stuff. Um, yep. So that's it. Oh, background vocals. Haven't I told you guys all this stuff before? <laughs> um, background vocals. Again, it depends on what you're doing background vocal wise. Uh, you know, is, is it a three or four part stacked harmony that's supposed to sound silky and glossy? Is it uh, one guy singing along with a punk track that's just picking up the third line of every chorus and you want them to sound kind of ragtaggy? So it depends, you know? If it's just one person singing either a unison or a harmony, harmony part with the lead singer, I would probably pan that down the middle and put a bit more reverb on that voice than I did on the lead vocal so that the um, background vocal part does sound like that guy is chiming in and not quite equal to, if you get what I mean. Um, for background vocals, let's say Eagles, Firefall, that kind of stuff, um, very often I would do the full group around a microphone in Omni and get the balance with the actual singers out in the room, have them drop a quarter by their left or right big toe so they can come back out and get the same place after they go to the restroom or come in for a playback. Um, and then double track those and sometimes even triple track them. Those I would tend to compress a lot. Um, I would roll off bottom end on those. I would probably roll off somewhere around 400 hertz in the low mids. I would probably boost around 10K-ish a bit. Um, and for vocals like that, honestly, I would probably revert to an EMT plate with like a one and a half to two second decay. Um, wow, the element to uh, help lift the reverb plates out of Compass Point Studios. They are seriously heavy, are they not? Rick Cabot Podmore very speeds the doubles and triples. Um, Michael, if you had to track background vocals at a different time, where where would I pan them? Um, I need more information, John. Uh, like if I'm doing like a three-part harmony stack and I'm recording each person um, one at a time, um, I would probably pan them all together so that they sounded like a group and then double track it. Remember, back in my day, we actually had to record this stuff. We had to go to each chorus and record the part and get it right and then double track it again. Um, Alex Dillon wants to know, why would I boost 10K? Because it sounded good. <laughs> it just sounded good. Um, I, again, go listen to like the background vocals on the Eagles song, Take It to the Limit. Um, that's the kind of backgrounds I'm talking about. In 10K puts them, uh, it's called, uh, what's the phrase, um, apparent loudness. There are certain frequencies between like 2K and 10K that are categorized as apparent loudness. You can make things appear to be louder than they are by boosting frequencies. And again, it depends on the key of the song, how cluttered the track is, there's so many variables. All these things change with all those other things, you know, the key of the song, the mood of the song, 
the timbre of the instruments, the room you're working in, the tempo of the song, all that stuff affects the decisions. But after you sit in that chair long enough, you don't have to sit there and analyze it and think about it. Your hand is reaching and turning a knob before you actually realize um, what you do or why you're doing it. Um, it does all depend on the song. Um, oh, here's a trick for you guys. Uh, I can't remember who I taught this to. Maybe it was here, I don't know. But I saw somebody mention plosives. Um, Popping peas. I always hated putting the foam windscreens on an 87. It sounded like this to me. I could hear it because I've got such incredible ears. No, it's, I could hear it, you know? I mean, come on. Um, I, I want to feel the stench of the breath on that microphone, but I don't want all the time. So I'll hold up my probiotics. Um, let's say this is my microphone. Better, this a little more realistic. Let's say this is an 87. I'm gonna to turn to the side for this. Um, most people, let's say this is the capsule of the 87. Most people would record right there. Plosive land, right? But if you invert the mic and put it up there, assuming that your singer isn't looking up at it, this is still aiming at the mouth, but the plosives are going out there. So you're getting the direct sound of the vocal cords in the mouth, but you're missing the plosives because you're looking at it from up there. Can you see? Yeah, you can see that. Make sense? Yeah, no pop filters. I mean, sometimes I would use them, sure. Can I talk about EQing bass? I, am, I have said this on the show before. I don't think I ever got a bass sound that I truly loved. The stuff that I played you on that Melanie record, kind of like that. Uh, I didn't remember liking it at the time, but in, in you know when I played it that day on the show, I liked it. Um, EQing bass, again, it depends on the key, depends on uh, the tempo of the song, depends on the type of song, all that stuff matters. But just as a general rule of thumb, I would roll off extreme bottom um, of course, this would be different from, you know, like a James Taylor acoustic ballad versus a Donna Summer disco record. They're just not the same thing. But I hardly ever used an amp on the bass unless the bass player insisted on it. Uh, almost always went with a direct box um, and would generally compress it a bit, not a lot unless I was doing disco. Um, and I would use an LA-2 very often. If I was doing uh, oompa, oompa, oompa kind of stuff, I would use a DBX-160 probably, sometimes an 1176 on that kind of part. Um, uh, and I would roll off, you know, like anything below, I would use a high pass filter, which might roll off below 100 Hertz, might roll off uh, depending on the mic and, uh, you know, or the console, uh, wherever your high pass is, um, maybe roll off anything below 60. First of all, you're going to get movements and footsteps. Um, you're going to get bass energy that you don't need that will actually affect the rest of your mix. Uh, it will affect your metering. So get rid of that stuff if you don't need it. And then I would probably boost like plus two, maybe plus three, maybe sometimes plus four, around 100 hertz, and probably boost 2.5K, about 2 dB, just to get a little bit of sound of the fingers. There you go. I like finger noise um, to some extent. I mean, sometimes it's really appropriate. Sometimes it's not. Um, I think one of the greatest bass sounds I've ever heard, I can't remember the name of the band, but remember that song, Get Down, Boogie, Oogie, Oogie? Um, I'm not going to sing it, <laughs> but get down, boogie, oogie, oogie. Who is that band? Nobody knows the answer to that one. I can tell you... I use a chart, look up the frequency, the lowest note played by the bass and roll off there. There you go. Um, 
Taste of Honey. Yes, go listen after the show. Go listen. Taste of Honey. Boogie oogie oogie. It was recorded on a classic like a Neve 8067, 8068, whatever. Um, Casey and the Sunshine Band. Actually, they recorded a lot of their stuff at um, TK Studios in Hialeah, Florida, where I, I did a record of a band called Wild Oats. It was kind of a, a rookie country rock sounding band, and I did it in that actual room. Now, you guys actually saw that picture of me sitting at a console. I held it up on the show one day. Um, the Mythic Neve. Yep. Yeah, that record just uh, get down boogie oogie oogie. It, it's just a great sounding record. But a lot of it, a lot of the great sound is derived from the parts. There just aren't that many parts. It's not cluttered. Um, Darren Moss, what rolling off means is, here, I'm going to show you this, and then we got to scoot, because our time is up for today. Okay. There's an EQ curve. Uh, there's the bottom end. Um, okay, so there, whoops, there's the bottom end. Uh, it's so hard to do it. There's 12 kilohertz. That's getting up there. That's, you know, a very high frequency. Um, you will rarely EQ up there. On occasion, you might. Down here is 100 hertz. That's usually kind of the bottom end of a bass guitar. So anything below that can be rolled off. So see how that curve slopes down? It rolls off the cliff. That's what I was taught in my RIAA recording class. Think of a roll off as rolling down a cliff. You don't need it anymore, so you shoved it off. That's what it is. It's just taking that curve, which in a perfect world, EQ, you know, starts out at a straight line. All frequencies equally represented with the same amount of amplitude. But if you want to um, roll off the bass, you just, you know, take a high pass filter means it lets the high frequencies pass and rolls off the bass. Mudslide, there you go. All right. Uh, oh, yes. Sheik had some of the best EQ and guitar work. Oh, Niall Rogers. There's a guy, you know, people often say to me, is there anybody that you wished you could have made a record with? Niall Rogers. Oh, be still my heart. Anyway, um, that's it. See you guys tomorrow for the Friday show. Bring a beer. <laughs> and I will see you then. Um, thank you, Dean, even though you weren't in the chat room today for letting me steal stuff from your book. And uh, there you go. Thank you all for a lovely day in the neighborhood. <laughs> You're right, my wife did sneeze upstairs. <laughs> <laughs>